And so they may have planned like a week ahead and you know contact with our you know flu from other companies, but they don't have to do that data. So that's where this kind of solution comes into the future. So I'm sorry I'm rushing, but hopefully I can answer the question too. I want to get to the question. So overall, you know, there are three parts, you know, with prediction solution, there's the data collection, uh, data, okay, of course, feature generation. Uh, and the model itself is unique because we're predicting rare events, uh, and, you know, to just from rare events, okay. So at the same time, we also have to predict for, you know, not so rare events, so for, you know, uh, like in the summer in an area like in the summer, tropical events are very common, and that will stop, it's very common. Uh, and on a daily basis, there will be like some high wind, you know, you just have to uh, predict out. So, I think we will cover some of these uh, data challenges. And then, you know, the area of storing these models every hour, you know, continuously, and uh, showing the results, you know, on a time. So, they can use it visually and make their own. So, in terms of data collection, we have weather data, we have the you know, geography, we have historic observations, we have the forecast for the data. Score. But we also use like infrastructure density because the weather is like you know, big across the globe, and we only want to choose the weather points that are along the grid, you know, that are relevant to the output. Otherwise, it can, um, you know, uh, bias the data. You can choose data points where there is no, you know, electric grid at all, uh, like northern part of Canada or something, you know, only bears live there. You know, you, you just, if you can have high winds, but it's of no value to the model. Uh, all the utility clients and they typically provide us historic data, outage data from which we know the map and we will go into detail. That's the key target value that we're trying to predict. But we also use other data sets from the client. And historically, what storms they have. So that we can evaluate the models against the storm performance. And while we get the data on a regular, you know, we have every day, every hour data, but they also identify these are our specific storm figures in this specific region or the utility period. You know, the storms can move as well. So we want to understand how their storms are, how they have identified the storms, and how they have accumulated the data for each of these storms. Um, there's something called a mobilization plan. You know, how do they mobilize their crew? So if you have 100, within 100 uh, outages in a day, they probably will mobilize, uh, you know, sparingly. But if they have, you know, 100 to 200, they might use their own crew. If they have over 1,000 outages, over 500 outages, they start contacting things like that. So they typically have a mobilization plan uh, at each spatial granular within the region, you know, smaller area of operation center within the region, which comprises of multiple operation center, and then for the entire phase. Okay. That's where their cost is. And then we also try to get, you know, vegetation data, we also try to give our, ourselves, like, depending on how the vegetation is close to our land, because they cause, I mean, they are, most of the time it's huge problems, there is falling on because of that, falling on the soil. And then you see that if an asset has been, you know, maintained recently, or new asset has been placed, a whole of power will be strong. So this is kind of like the background of the problem, why they're doing this. So I'm going to give to a handover to Vivian, she'll talk to the data challenges. So. So the goal here is to use weather data to predict the weather related the outage. So we have two data sets, outage and weather data. Um, outage is uh, relatively easy to aggregate because outage is available at the operation center level. So yeah, the two are to combine it. And then from the operation center should be a polygon that covers a city or an area that the utility company is operating on. So um, all this data is available at the operation center level and available at a, based on a time stamp. And in order to merge it with the weather data, we want to aggregate all this data and weather data to outreach, uh, to uh, operation center level and also to a 24 hours window level. Uh, we will explain that more uh, in our next slide. Um, so weather data is a little bit hard to aggregate because first weather data is at the more granular level. So you can see the small box um, on the card is the 4.4 kilometer grid point. So weather data is available every hour at this granularity. So the first uh, challenge is uh, we have a lot of weather data that we need to handle this big volume. So we use PySpark to handle the data volume. And the second aspect of the weather data aggregation is the order of aggregation. 
Because Valor data is uh, available at a small granular level and also Valor data is available at hourly level. So uh, in order to enter to a 24 hours rolling window plus uh, operation center level. So uh, for some features like maximum features, whether we take maximum across all the grids or maximum across 24 hours, it doesn't matter, the order doesn't matter for some features. But for features like average, if you want to calculate the average moon dust, like how do we aggregate the average? Like do we do a temporal approach or do we aggregate spatial first? It depends on the methodology needed. So like whenever what we choose, it has to make sense from a methodology perspective. So these are the features we used mainly in the model. Uh, wind gas is the most important feature. Because uh, a small, uh, uh, short, but strong wind gust can bring down vegetations. And if the vegetation it happen to be located close to a power line or to a power wire, uh, if the vegetation fall on those infrastructure, it will cause outage damages. And the second uh, group of features are the precipitation feature. How this affects outage is the precipitation make the soil moisture value high. So the pore that buried in the soil will come loose. So uh, with the soil moisture value high and with some wind uh, at a certain weather condition combination, it will bring down the power line. Um, and snow ice feature, how it, how it works is uh, in the winter, snow and ice could accumulate on the power line. So it will add a lot of weight so and when the wind blows, it will cross. And temperature feature in the winter, below or above freezing temperature makes a big difference in the model. And the next uh, group of feature is infrastructure feature. So we use this feature um, indirectly and directly in the model. So this feature including number of holes and number of lines of wires or number of lines of lines, uh, it is like a some different features describe the infrastructure of the client. So we use this feature directly in the model. And also, more importantly, when we aggregate feature, average weather feature, for example, we calculate average wind dust, we will weight the grid points, which is in this slide. So if the grid points is close to infrastructure, we will weight more for those uh, grid points. If it's not close to anywhere, we will not use any information from those. And if it's uh, far away, we still use it, but with less weight on it. So these are the uh, average uh, feature aggregation. And so after the feature aggregation, before we go to the modeling, uh, the one thing we need to make sure is uh, to check the data quality. Uh, we do basic standard, uh, basic sanity check uh, on the data set itself, like the weather data itself and the outage data itself. Uh, but some feature and some patterns we can only find them when we put multiple data set together. For example, this is what we call long tail problem. So the, the black line here is the observation or is a, or you can call it uh, outage tickets, is the sum of the outage tickets. And the other line, blue and the red, they are wind gust and the cumulative precipitation. And in this specific scenario, so in the beginning of May 6th, the outage came down slowly, but the weather event has already passed. Like the weather event starts from May 4th and it's a peak peak at the uh, end of May 4th, in the beginning of May 6th, wind gust and the precipitation came down. But the outage only came down slowly. So this could uh, simply be caused during the storm. People do not have access to phones or do not have access to internet. So we cannot make the phone call to report the outage. So the, the outage company, the power company, they just uh, don't collect these tickets during the storm. But a few hours after the storm, uh, after the worst time, or like one or two days after the worst time, people also like start to call in. So that's why we have a long tail, like in this uh, dash box, in the box, like we have a long tail of outage tickets. So this is very common for almost all the big storms. Because big storms, the, the weather event may only happen on one day, but the effect can, can go on for like three, five days, or even longer. So, but this uh, data, type of data, uh, will be confusing to the model because uh, there is no weather event, but we record high uh, outage tickets. So we simply remove those data from the model, from the training data. 
And the second scenario is similar to the first one, but less common. The first one is very common. This one is less common. This is where we have a large stone event, like the stone outage is very high, it's almost a uh, hundred outages. And uh, but we don't have uh, weather, significant weather to support this uh, stone event. So this could be cause of um, inaccurate cost code. So we only forecast, we only forecast the weather related outage. So if the outage is not weather related, so we use cost code to filter weather related outage. So we uh, rely on the client to provide us the uh, accurate cost code, and also if this cost code is uh, relevant to uh, whether or not. So like some cost code is just called unknown or reason code specified, and we have cost code like that. So in that case, um, the cost code or the weather tickets may not cost by weather, but we uh, in, in, uh, improve in, uh, included in the model. So this could cause uh, this like second scenario where we have a, a peak in the outage, but uh, there is nothing happening in the weather side. So we also remove this type of data from the training data. The third scenario is a little bit different. So this uh, is the opposite case. This is where we have a high weather uh, weather value, but a uh, low outage data. So the outage here is only uh, four. Like four outage, we consider it as a routine day outage where we do not need any mobilization. So this uh, is because of whether the cost code or the weather data, like other of them, like not accurate. But uh, like, no matter what reason, we remove those data from the training set. The second data challenge is uh, related to the characteristic of the target data, which is outage data. So outage data um, is the rare event. So in this case, the outage data range from zero to 2,000. So most of the days, like in the very bottom, most of the days are routine days. So this account for 90, you were like 92, 93 percent of the data. So those, these are the days that we call the blue sky day, like no mobilization is needed. Uh, so we don't need to do anything. And what we want to predict is the uh, storm days and the extreme storm days. Extreme storm days happen very rare, like only maybe once or twice a year, like they are historically uh, very significant in the history. Um, so uh, in order to handle this wide range and sparsity issue, um, that this is also this is a data challenge, but it's also a modeling challenge. So we build a regressor to classify um, the data first, based on the weather event. We build a model to classify if it is a storm day or is a routine day. And for storm day, we have a set of model, routine day, we have another set of model. And for the data sparsity, so the way we aggregate tickets to a 24 hours window instead of every hour, like we don't predict every hour, is this hour we predict for the next 24 hours. So this is how to handle the sparsity issue. And another way we handle sparsity issue is um, if the client does not have enough historical data, because each client has different uh, lines of the data. Some clients may only have two years or three years of data. So we only have a handful of events in our data set. So in that case, uh, sometimes we group several operation centers together and to build one model for a group of operation center. And if the client has like five, six years of data and has enough uh, of each event to model, then we, yeah, we don't need to group them. So these are the uh, two data challenges. Um, and talking about modeling, uh, we tried a bunch of uh, machine learning algorithms. And, uh, so we have a model structure, like random first. So here we just put it very briefly. Random first is a regressor we used in the whole model structure. Um, and when we test the data, also we build the data, we, we build the model with historic data. Uh, but in operation, uh, operationally, like when client is seeing on their UI, they, uh, they, the forecast is based on forecast data. The forecast of outage is based on the forecast of weather. So when we build the model and test the model, we do it on both data set, historic weather data and forecast weather data. Um, and because of the large range, the wide range of the outage data, we don't uh, we can calculate accuracy score just uh, on the RSME just based on the individual hours or the individual hours prediction 
of the individual days per day trip because the number on the routine they could be very small and a small number due to a very large uh, live score. So we how we do it is uh, we aggregate the office data or the actual and both actual and prediction by event. So it's the event based instead of uh, prediction based on the day or hour it is. It's event based. So we create something like a storm profile. Um, so for the storm, like we have uh, storm A in location A, what's the prediction? What is the actual? What is the arrow? So we use one number to sum summarize the storm happening on a specific location. And after building this storm profile, we um, calculate the accuracy uh, or the hit score, the RMC based on that. And another important perspective of uh, effect of the uh, of the accuracy is the first alarm. We, the first alarm, we, we design first alarm for routine days. So routine days are those days like 90% 90, 90 days where we have blue sky, no alert, no weather event. Um, so for those days, we do not want to predict the operation. It will cost that there are uh, more than anything. The people, uh, they will cost the uh, mechanical company, but it does not seem like we have it. So we want to avoid that scenario as well. So that we measure by first alarm. So with the hit and the first alarm, with this two score, uh, if we have a lot of parameters to kill, we will utilize, we utilize some automatic tools to automatically algorithm to help us do the first round of model selection if we have like tens of thousands of models. Um, so we utilize a parental graph that's one of our techniques we have other things to do. And uh, also uh, after the first round we also based on client preference to select the model. So like some clients may prefer high hit rate, uh, some may prefer low force alarm rate. And some may uh, uh, like focus on the medium size storm, some focus on the very extreme storm. So, based on the current requirement, we do some like seven round selection. So, yeah, this is a uh, note down by one step. Yeah. So, is, is that process involved for people that are involved at all? Because, like, some validation of these are in do you have to do that at all, or does the computer do that for you? Uh, like check you know, what problem is the test? You mean like before modeling, like do we process the data? So here you're doing model selection, right? Yes. In order to see the work that you do, to detail what they are processing, you have to know the important specific properties of the properties of the control events, like whether it's stationary or not. Um, and, uh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we call all the models only one week, uh, and what and what she's talking about is one week and finish modeling. You know, then we build also a framework in the so that you know that's flexible to just calculate, you know, figure out which model for that particular client based on the much of the language she's going to So what you're talking about is happening, you know, ahead of time before we actually get to the Oh. Because here it is dependent on the client's requirement that we choose which model. So when she talks about hit it is like, am I having a hit on the mobilization level? So there's the actual output is predicting the output, there's also the actual mobilization level and we're predicting a mobilization level, right? Uh, we predicted 19 output is, which means it's mobilization level one. But the actual is uh, 150, which is mobilization level three. So sometimes they just want to know which level you're predicting at. And that's key because that's what drives the operation. So we have a framework that we are just based on each client. Like we had a client in the Pacific side, and they basically were they said we want to focus on the medium stuff. I, I know when you get a big one, you know, we're done. You know, but anyway, but we have clients here who say, okay, we have this much measure. You tell us which ones are going to be good. So they focus more on the bigger stuff and they want action numbers. So uh, during our building the model and our conversation with client, uh, one question I've been asked a lot of times. Also, we ask uh, to ourselves is why the model is predicting this number, um, especially when the uh, event is approaching. Uh, the customer, the client wants to know uh, is this number reliable? Like based on what feature are you predicting this? Or based on what uh, you know, what other features you put in. So, 
So because of this, we build this uh, extreme uh, extreme motion tools, and so we have a standard set of extreme tools like shot and run. The standardized tool is available in Python, I think, as an AX fifteen. Um, so in, in addition to that, uh, we also build the local explainer like contrastive analysis, sensitivity analysis, and tree analysis. So contrastive analysis is uh, when we have two predictions and they are close to each other, but the predictions are very different. So uh, the client will wondering from prediction A to prediction B, why is the uh, change so much or what features driving this prediction uh, to, to which direction? So contrastive analysis is to, to answer that question. Sensitivity analysis is to is also giving a specific prediction. Um, if I change the wind gust, if I increase it by one meter per second or decrease by one meter per second, how it will change the final result. So it's a sensitivity or a feature giving a prediction. And tree analysis is uh, also giving one prediction. So all these are local explainers. So we explain a specific uh, prediction, not like on like the vision models, which are the global explainer. So uh, tree analysis, so we use tree analysis to uh, if there is an old prediction, under prediction, we want to see what uh, features or what the, what the data in the training data that makes this uh, prediction over predicted or under predicted. We have an example on the tree analysis. The next slide. Okay, so first of all, this is a over prediction. Um, so in this case, we choose the number of tree uh, 500. So the prediction is uh, 17.28. This is the over prediction and 17.28 is the average of the 500 trees. So in order to find what trees that cause the over prediction, we plot the tree depths uh, on the x-axis and the prediction on the y. So you can see the top three points that are far away from all the rest of points. These are the top three trees that uh, cause the over prediction. And there are also like maybe some points in the middle cause the prediction, but we try to we try to eliminate the problem little by little. So we pick the, the most uh, severe, the, the baddest tree in the forest. And the second chart is the uh, same data uh, present in a different way. So you see the um, the circles, three dots, and the second chart is a small bar that on the very end of the chart is uh, close to 140. And most of the trees have prediction anywhere around 0 to 20. So we want to see what caused this three tree to predict 140. Well, actually, this is four trees. It's three points, but it's four trees. One tree has uh, exactly uh, two trees have exactly the same prediction. So we go to each of the four trees to uh, understand what features and what conditions that drives the prediction. The prediction here is like 138, almost 140. So with this condition, we go back to the training data and uh, filter based on the condition and uh, pick up those events that have very high outages. And so these events, if the if a specific events or several specific events appear multiple times on in those bad trees, then we consider to remove them. So um, this is a part of the data cleaning, but like you see, this. Uh, is we cannot uh, detect uh, this type of detail uh, just based on this previous analysis of plotting two charts together. So um, during the entire process, like model evaluation, model selection, we may say such cases that we need to remove the data uh, from the model. So after removing this, uh, if there is one event that caused all the four trees to all predict, we remove this and then look at the prediction later after removing. And, and this is the second case of um, explainer. The shop is a standard tool that you can find in Python. So this is a, also a prediction for the 8.784. Um, by using sharp, we know how much does each feature contribute to the prediction. Um, so like sharp and the tree analysis, we can all describe the same problem from different perspectives. This one is uh, describing from the feature perspective. The other one is the describing from the data perspective. So when we look at the one problem or we look at the one prediction, we try to explain one prediction, uh, we look from different perspectives and then have a comprehensive answer. 
And so this the tool we not only use for support of the model, we also use the for um, tuning the model. Like when we build the model, we train the model, we use it to tune the data, to tune the model by cleaning out the data. And, oh, so yeah, this is the okay, So basically the point here is that because of the very nature of the data, so the outage event is not after the same set of you know, range of other data. So we need to, yeah, we do the data quality checks, we do the model, we do the tooling, we look at all these other tooling issues, and then, uh, you know, we go back, we can do the model evaluation of the tooling one year aside, because we need to have a full year of data set to do blind tests, because we don't see it. And then, you know, we use a explainability tool to understand, you know, what the issues are, go back and do the whole thing. We haven't really tried the model automatically because it does require us to visualize, you know, the performance. And, um, so this is how the process goes. But if you read all of it, you can imagine, you know, the addition to our parameter, in this case, this feature, and of course, we have weather threshold variables too. So what we have done is we built like a model scaling and a training scaling environment, you know, how to do the stability. But basically, we just crank it out and we generate a whole bunch of models. And then there's this evaluation uh, framework, uh, this trade-off, which is just dump all the names and iterate false alarms. And then we do this for a that as she was said, showing. And, you know, and then, you know, of course, then we have to use the results from the evaluation framework, visualize them, and figure out what's our uh, best model based on the client criteria. So this is possible. We try to automate as much as possible. Um, so that's that's it for model training. I just want to spend a minute or two on the coding itself. And uh, I mean, it's not uh, you know, I guess one might say meaningful of scoring, but I just want to highlight a few points when it comes to scoring weather-based models, which many of you may have done already. Uh, so in the case of a coding machine, what it does is that uh, you know, uh, we are actually picking the weather forecast data, right? It's a now it's itself a prediction. We use our own APS to get the weather forecast data. We push it to the same high spark each generation code because as we have proper match of features. Uh, there are some differences, you know, in the in the weather variables that we get historically versus uh, uh, you know versus the forecast data. And this is why we work very we have worked very closely with meteorologists to make sure the variables are aligned and then the features that are talked with are identical. Once we do that, then what we do is depending on the granularity for spatial granularity for which the client wants us to predict, we choose the corresponding uh, model. Okay, so either we have a model for each offset, if that is spatial granularity, or a model for every feeder, we have multiple feeders within an operation framework. Or you know, we have a model for a bunch of feeders, a bunch of operation centers because the data was kept, as you know, we were saying. But then you know we use that model and then score for that particular op center and how each op center is different from maybe others is because their infrastructure data. Okay, so so those are big files for every region that we're going to predict, we're going to use the infrastructure data and tell us which model to use. And then uh, this is part of Inland Java. Okay, when we first started doing this work you know, seven years ago, uh the data is written in Java, it, it uh, you know scales. Forms very well. Uh, uh, that intention is not coming, but that's what we've done. Um, and then, of course, the results go to a database where we store not just the forecast data because if you want to debug, we store the features. And you know, the forecast weather data is not archived. So you know, when we start off with a new client, we don't have archived forecast data. It's it's huge. Okay, so it's not possible. The historic data is on the grid. It's re analysis. So we store this so the future we, when we go back and retrain one, we can you know check the performance of the forecast as well. And we also store the predictions through an API and go to the So that's the full uh, pipeline of uh, the solution. Um, yeah, and uh, we do the, the piece and of course as, as we speak, it's uh, you know the system is running for several clients, it's predicting every hour, and for some clients the pre horizon has been marked for some for several. Um, I think that's about it. I have something else in my mind that I want to say, but I think we ran out of time. Uh, we can answer questions. Thank you, Henry. Now we can take questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand. So I see that you have this hourly prediction for like 24 hours, 48 hours. I'll just point uh, understand like 
next hour's prediction is like different. It's a different number. The portal shows it. Yes, so yeah. we, we didn't show the portal. So in the portal, we did say that we gave any one particular date. We did say uh, the first 24 hours, you have another child for 24, 48, 48, 72 hours. So they use that information. Let's say the storm is coming in, you know, this um, Thursday. Like today's Wednesday. I think it's, so it, it's coming in on Saturday. Then they will say that it was three, three days. And, okay. and then tomorrow they look at the two days. And they also see the weather data in the portal. We have been shown here, but it also shows the weather. Okay. So we, we show the weather forecast, we show our prediction, and it will change. It will be very interesting. It actually changes because the forecast changes our predictions also. Right. So, like, how, how does a client understand it? In this way? So, for example, like last hour, the clients uh, see that there will be outage, uh, an enormous outage, but the next hour they check the prediction again to show that. Yeah, sometimes it goes down, and uh, you know, and they at this point, you know, either they come back and say, "No, fluctuate." Okay, fluctuate either means that the predictions are fluctuating, okay, or there may be a problem with that. Let me go back and look at. It. But most of the time, it doesn't fluctuate that. You know, you can see that fluctuate, and they also will get some information that's actually interesting because they might see that hey, you know, uh, the storm is really less to the you know, so you you see a lot of outages first here and then you know in the second region and, then, and depending on how it's moving the outages also will change. Thank you. Yeah. What sort of spatial scale do you help with the prediction part? The part of why I, I ask is that I assume all of this is outage of like the distribution model. Correct. And yeah. so the different parts of the distribution system might have um, Different AC network topologies and who's aligned and not have a lot of them. Correct, correct. Good uh, question. Very good question. Yeah, it's really hard to predict on a standard. Standard is really difficult. Yes. Okay. So the minimum we have gone to is a few days. But the client tells us, okay, we got, you know, historically they should be able to say we have this outage of this field. Some of them give us the lag long. We have tried predicting a lag long, it's a big challenge because don't have you know enough outages for that lack of mm -hmm. and there is not enough defense in the infrastructure that the model cannot. I will add that we haven't tried very complex deep learning pipelines to see that, but it is a challenge because you know, because there may be outages. And even if you have outages, you know one outage in this span may have happened like one year, and then it may have happened like seven years later, but some completely different weather. So are you trying to do data from like train kind of on each computer individually or across all you use outer data across all of the feeders or so what we do is we uh, sometimes try to say okay these are the outages, all the outages for this operation which has many features. So then we train this for that. And then what we could do is if there is enough data, then fast, fine, we can predict close to you. are done. If not, then we would accumulate across all the feeders and then use some other characteristics of the feeder. We build one model. And then there are some features that are specific to that feeder that we will shift to the feeder in the score. But in one model, that will be scoring. Yeah. Uh, so you said that you trained a whole bunch of models, uh, like a whole suite of models. No, we just use Docker. Okay. So the, yeah, so the scoring is happening in you know, Docker. Well, so so uh, uh, identify where you uh, you ran hundreds of thousands of models or something. Hundreds of models. Yeah. Hundreds of models. Okay. But was that going to be the process or was it going to be because no, no, because we ran, essentially it's running in parallel, right? Because we told us a lot of this. So they oh. just run in parallel. Yeah, it, it goes very fast. We could try DAS or something, which is only kind of a task. When we actually when we try the map. Yeah. That became a thing. Okay. Uh, so the explanatory part, uh, here is if you have to account for correlations in the regions, like for example, um, wind speed at that location of the object is like very highly correlated with how geospatial other locations in the 
geography is separated from the lot of small problems. So when you look at the Shafi values, I'm curious if something like this is a problem where the other pieces are very problem to each other and they are not necessarily equal problem. So you're asking the wind speed at one location is correlated with wind speed at a different location. And both are featured in the model. And if you do a Shafi analysis, it'll basically tell you that both these features are like highly important. Uh, but only one of them is like I guess causal way. But how is that one basic feature for heavy objects? Yeah, I guess my question is more generally like the causal features and some of them are causal features. That is something that both are not training itself. Yeah, yeah. 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 and you yeah. do a model with your features that can be running before uh, building a model. I try to remove those features that are correlated. Like for wind gas feature, we only have one wind gas feature and one wind speed feature. Um, yeah, like one feature from each category. It's hard to remove it before that. Yeah, and actually over time, we also learn which ones are from the wind right. speed and just on the high level. Thank you. Does it matter about uh, necessarily? The eventual, like there's a lot of focus on the trees, right? As the trees are the big small thing that then takes down the power line, but kind of like say like a car accident caused it, do, like that might happen more likely because of weather. weather. Yeah, then it depends on how the flight is called out the ticket. Yeah. Yeah. So as Vivian was saying, you know, sometimes it's not the cause, it's not the cause of the and that you know, throws us off. Okay. So I mean, I guess you know, they're also putting the cost as they are. Collecting the outage details, right? So, yes, they may have market as a better cost. Yeah, because the cost will be the rise in the rate. Thank you. Thank you. I love how I'm having my cost for. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, cost less. Yeah, we call them. We call them the form. We treat them.